And as we were talking about the financial aspects already, uh, I'd like to recommend that you elaborate on your methodological steps at the same time as you elaborate on your budget and your timetable. And to do this, you can create a file in a spreadsheet program such as Excel and you insert two spreadsheets, one for the budget, one for the timetable. And in the budget spreadsheet, in the top row, you distinguish your three years of research. And on the left hand side column, you insert all the items that you need to buy, the services that you need to contract, the flight tickets that you need to purchase, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me get this straight. Um, I should allocate the incurring costs to the year in which they occur. So for example, if my research is planning to cover 50 household surveys and I'm planning to have only 20 surveys in the first year, I should allocate the costs for conducting these surveys for the first year of my budget and then the remaining part, for example 30 villages, should be in the second year. So I should basically attribute 40% of the incurring travel and translation costs to one year and 60 to the year two. Translation I say because of course many researchers actually go to countries where they don't speak the native language so they also have to engage with someone who would translate the interview results. Exactly, yes. And um, while you are putting together the costs you could also try to already uh, sort them according to categories. For example, you have equipment, laptop computer or a thermal camera. You have consumables that could be lab chemicals or printer ink or paper. And you may have labor costs, for example, this uh, translating person or a student assistant. Mm -hmm. You have travel costs, you have visa costs and you have uh, costs for publishing your papers. All of this listed in this table and sorted makes the budget really easy to view by the reviewers. Yes, I see that actually. So if I work on my budget spreadsheet and in parallel I work on the methodology, I will actually get a realistic overview of the costs of my research. And then I will also perhaps be able to realize very quickly if I'm exceeding this budget and if the exceeding budget that I have is no longer fitting to what the funding institutions are covering. Exactly, yes. And in this event that your budget is uh, far too expensive and the donor will not fund it, then you can of course again look for another donor that may fund costly research or you can of course try to see what um, of the research that you are planning can be replaced by a cheaper uh, approach or what can be even dropped. For example, if you plan to conduct a survey all across India in 120 villages, that is very expensive because you travel so much. Maybe you can also do that survey in 120 villages in just southern India. Or you reduce from the 120 villages to 60 or 80. And when we come back to our previous um, irrigation experiment, you plan for five watering treatments repeated in five locations and five replications per location and treatment, that may not necessarily um, yeah, be the way to go to reach your research goal. You could also probably arrive at what you want to achieve with only three treatments repeated in three locations and that will cut of course the budget quite substantially. So look for possibilities that make your budget slim or take out very expensive parts altogether but of course you shouldn't then reduce on the novelty and um, attractiveness of your proposal. Hmm. But in the case that cutting down on sample sites is actually not something that I want to do and the replication doesn't seem to be an option for me, then I could perhaps shift away from the irrigation experiment in women's markets gardens and maybe conduct the irrigation experiment in a research station. 
I could mimic the conditions and with that actually lower the costs substantially. Yes, that would also be a good alternative. But um, if you are not able to really uh, reduce the costs without either losing on this novelty um, or um, yeah, doing the PhD altogether, then I think there is again now a point to say, well, probably it's better that I look for a fully funded PhD position and not pursue my own research ideas anymore because um, these fully funded positions do of course have a lot of money also for conducting the field work, the lab work, whatever you need. And uh, so always in this um, process of proposal writing be very honest to yourself um, because there may be several points where you come to the conclusion that what you plan is not really um, yeah, a proposal that works for a scholarship. Mm -hmm. But let's say I'm very confident that my research will actually uh, be groundbreaking and that the budget that I've constructed is going to meet the budgetary requirements of the target donor institution. Um, what should be the next step then? Well, as I said already, you should also work on the timetable in parallel to working on the methods section and on the budget. And in the upper row of that timetable spreadsheet, you put the numbers for the months 1 to 36 or longer, depending on how long your PhD proposal will be funded. And then on the left-hand side column, you list your major activities. Mm -hmm. And you can start, for example, with the arrival at your host organization or host institution and then continue with the preparation of the field research or the lab experiments and then add each of your methodological steps in the order in which they will occur later on. And what is very important also is that in between the steps of field data or lab data collection you also leave a bit of time for looking at the data, for analyzing it and for writing your research chapters or your research papers. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end you have a list of tasks that is doable and that ends with the handing in of your thesis and the PhD defense. And now when you have compiled this uh, table you make a small X or you color the cells for the months in which those different tasks are to be um, executed. Yeah, so this is a very good suggestion because uh, this exercise will quickly show our students whether there are periods with no activity or periods with three to four activities running in parallel. So if you ultimately realize that there are too many tasks to be conducted at one time, or that in month four of year three, you're still collecting field data, go back to the text of your methodology section and modify or reduce the number of tasks in such a way that you can successfully conduct your PhD research from the first month to the last. So basically, uh, don't leave everything for the last year because you will then have a mission impossible in front of you. Exactly. <laughs> but. Um, Assume that you have now uh, compiled a good budget, have uh, elaborated a very doable timetable and uh, also written and corrected the method section back and forth. Then you have really taken a huge step forward. It's heavy work, but doing that very nicely is also rewarding later on uh, because a reviewer will see that you put a lot of thought in how you do your research. Mm -hmm.